There were three ravens sat on a tree Down a down, hey down a down They were as black as they might be With a down One of them said to his mate Where shall we our breakfast take? With a down, dairy, 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 down, down. Hello and welcome to a special Advent 2023 edition of the Three Ravens podcast. My name's Martin Vaux. I'm a writer, storyteller and English romanticism obsessive. And I'm joined, as ever, by my partner in crime and all dark arts. Eleanor Conlon. Hello! We're counting down to Christmas over 12 days of mini-episodes, culminating in our Three Ravens Christmas special on Christmas Day, using the 12 Days of Christmas song as a wafer-thin justification to talk about interesting historical and folkloric tidbits roughly related to Yuletide. Day 10. Ho, 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 Martin, today is French hens, which always struck me as a bit peculiar. Yeah. French horns are a very famous thing, True. very Christmassy, but <laughs> is French hen even really a thing? <laughs> well, yes. Our best guess is that the song is referring to a breed of chicken called the Bresse Galloise, which has blue legs, a white body and a red comb on its head, meaning its colours are are the colours of the French flag. Whoa, and did these type of chickens exist before the 12 Days of Christmas song was written down? So the first reference we have to them in writing comes from 1591, and French writer Jean-Antelme Brillat Savarin, the author of The Physiology of Taste, later wrote about the Bresse Galloise, and I'm going to do an accent here, that they are the queen of poultry, the poultry of kings. I'm guessing he wrote that in French rather than in English. He did, but you know my French. Say, tres, tres, malvais. Oui, oui. Although, mon cher, this does seem rather like an open and shut case. The Bresca Loise is the French hen of the song, n'est-ce pas? Well, it seems likely, but a couple of interesting things to throw into the stock part. For example, as previously discussed, the Romans used to call France Gaul, and the Latin name we still use for chickens today is Gallus Gallus. Okay, so that would seem to suggest that chickens have been associated with France for a very long time. Yeah, they sure have. Plus, starting in earnest during the Middle Ages, and explicitly under the royal house of Valois, who ruled France from 1328 to 1589, and then the Bourbon kings, who ruled France up until the French Revolution, the royal effigy was often accompanied by the rooster, which was often seen as the symbol of France. C'est alors. This is very interesting. <laughs> well, let's not forget that England's relationship with France across history tended to be very different to the one we have today. Well, today, alas, we have a slightly fractious, slightly pedantic relationship with our nearest neighbour. Yeah. Brexit, of course, has made that a little worse, mm. along with making a lot of things a little worse. <laughs> but hey, at least we aren't beating seven bells out of one another anymore. No, and haven't done so since 1942, when the British fought against Vichy France. But before then, things were a little bit more tense. Well, you alluded to the French Revolution. There was plenty of Anglo-French warring when Napoleon was getting all up at yeah, get back in your box, Napoleon. But before then, we had conflicts including the Seven Years' War, the Nine Years' War, loads of Italian wars where the British were on the other side to the French. Yeah, and that's only mentioning a handful of fairly recent ones. I mean, if you get back a bit, then the English-French warring that people in this country get all excited and sentimental about, including the Hundred Years' War, you know, it's pretty darn old. You've got battles like Agincourt, Crecy, Poitiers, many, many others from that whole night ridey roundy on horses period of time. Ah, yes. Agincourt. The era of the English <laughs> longbow of knights galloping on horseback. <laughs> What's he that wishes so? My cousin Westmoreland? No, my fair cousin. If we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. Uh-oh, she's off. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honour. God's will. I pray thee, wish not one man more. By Jove, I am not covetous for gold. Nor care I who doth feed upon my cost. It yearns me not if men my garments wear. Such outward things dwell not in my desires. But if it be a sin to covet honour, I am the most offending soul alive. No faith, my cuz, 
Wish not a man from England. God's peace, I would not lose so great an honour as one man more methinks would share from me for the best hope I have. Oh, do not wish one more. Rather proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host, that he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made, and crowns for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when the day is named, and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbours and say, Tomorrow is Saint Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, These wounds I had on Crispin's day. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap whilst any speaks that fought with us upon St Crispin's day. Oh, well done, darling. That was lovely. Thank you. <laughs> and St Crispin's Day, of course, is in October, the battle of which Shakespeare puts those words into Henry V's mouth, being the Battle of Agincourt. And yes, although the French and the English were at one another's throats for a lot of history, people sometimes forget Brittany in northwest France and what an important place it was for early Britain, or Breton. Well, yes, because in the Gallic era, when Gaul was Gaul and men were men, yes. there was a much closer set of cultural connections between England and France. Yes, certainly. Before Gaul was conquered by Rome, the same Celtic beliefs found in the British Isles were particularly strong in what we call Brittany today, with trading taking place with southwest England in particular, especially for tin. And after Rome started to fall apart, particularly towards the end of the 4th century, loads of people from the Kingdom of Dumnonia, so so Devon and Cornwall, as we've spoken about on the podcast before, invaded and founded Brittany under legendary Celtic leader Conan Meriadoc. Which is why, in no small part, the language of Brittany is so closely related to Cornish. Yeah, exactly that. Now, much of southwest England, Wales and northwest England, along with Brittany in France and Galicia in northern Spain, were all part of this one Britonic empire. Super duper interesting. Mm. And when it comes to French hens, it therefore makes sense that people in England would know the taste of French poultry particularly well, yeah. as parts of France France and parts of England and Wales were for centuries all parts of overlapping kingdoms and disputed territories. Exactement. And then there's the whole other part of this, the hen in folklore. Oh my goodness, we've just spent all this time talking about French hens in history. <laughs> You've been doing Shakespeare. <laughs> the chicken must rock up in hundreds of folk and fairy tales. Yes. The one that jumps to mind for me, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it's a fairy tale or yeah. just a children's book, but uh, Henny Penny, more commonly known these days as Chicken Licking. Yeah, a surprisingly young story, that one, made popular by the Brothers Grimm, though the first version we have written down still only comes from the 19th century in a Danish variant called Killing Cluck. <laughs> oh, it's such a cute story. You have to tell it. All right, then. Well, one morning, a young chicken called Henny Penny is pecking away in the farmyard when, whack, an acorn hits her on the head. Goodness gracious, she says, the sky is falling. I must go and tell the king. Oh, silly Henny Penny. So along Henny Penny goes and she meets Cocky Locky, who asks her, where are you going, Henny Penny? Henny Penny explains the situation and Cocky Locky, understandably unnerved, decides to join her on her quest. 
And as they go across the course of the day, they meet in turn Ducky Daddles and Goosey Lucy and Turkey Lurkey. Each of them says, where are you going, Henny Penny? To which Henny Penny replies, well, the sky's falling. I've got to go and tell the king. Henny Penny, what a fuss you're making. <laughs> of course, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Lucy and Turkey Lurkey all join Cocky Locky and Henny Penny on their journey to see the king. But eventually, as the afternoon's just turning into evening, they bump into Foxy Woxy. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, indeed. For Foxy Woxy asks Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Lucy and Turkey Lurkey where they're going. And Henny Penny explains, well, we're going to the king to tell him the sky's falling. Oh, says Foxy Loxy, licking his lips. But this isn't the way to the king. I know the proper way. Shall I show it to you? Well, Henny Penny, Cocky Locky, Ducky Daddles, Goosey Lucy and Turkey Lurkey all thank Foxy Woxy for being so courteous and kind. And he leads them along until, with the stars in the sky and the moon shining down, they come to a narrow, dark hole. This, says Foxy Woxy, is the shortcut to the king's palace. We'll be there in no time if we go this way. Follow me. And Foxy Woxy steps down into the narrow dark hole, which is, in fact, Foxy Woxy's burrow. A troublesome twist in the tale. <laughs> Who could have seen it coming? <laughs> no. So down steps Turkey Lurkey and crack. Foxy Woxy breaks his first neck of the night, slinging Turkey Lurkey's body over his shoulder. And down steps Goosey Lucy. Crack. Same thing happens. Ducky Daddles follows. Crack. Only then, just as Cocky Locky steps down into the hole, a sudden urge overtakes him. He can't contain it, so it bubbles out of him. A call of alarm, and he crows, cock a doodle doo <laughs> Now, annoyed at all the noise, Foxy Woxy breaks Cocky Locky's neck as well, but outside of the burrow, Henny Penny hears his cry and pauses. My goodness, Henny Penny thinks, because though it's the middle of the night, she figures Cocky Locky's crow must mean it's dawn. So it must be time to lay my eggs, she thinks. So she turns around, bustles back to her nest, escaping certain death and never telling the king that the sky was falling after all. You've got to love a bit of Henny Penny. Yeah. Not at least because I think we all know a Henny Penny. Oh, for sure. If not several Henny Pennies. <laughs> well, arguably the entire 24-hour news business is predicated on the idea that the world needs many more Henny Pennies. Not to say I don't love the news and believe everyone should stay up on current events, but buy newspapers and read them, everyone. Different papers on different days, get a broad view and make up your own damn mind. But I'm Imagining there are chickens in all sorts of folk tales. Well, there are, and we're not going to be able to talk about half of them. We're not even going to try. Instead, I'm going to pick three interesting chicken-based anecdotes to round off the episode. So, Eleanor, what's it going to be? Door number one, door number two, or door number three? I will go for door number two, please. Okay, very well. Uh, behind door number two is... Electromancy, one of the most ancient forms of divination, all about the use of chickens. Does this involve cutting chickens open and reading their innards for portents? Because <laughs> if so, I'm not sure I want too many gory details. Well, the Romans <laughs> definitely did do that, and they also prized a thing called a cockstone. <laughs> What? I don't know what's so funny. A cock stone is a magical gem, and the Romans believed it could be found in a cock's head. Maybe in its mouth, maybe in its comb, and people used them for divination. What kind of divination? We don't actually know. Ah. It's lost to the annals of time. But we know that they were much prized and sought after, whereas electromancy is something different. It's much more humane. That's where you make little piles of grain in particular shapes. So letters, for example, symbolising answers to a question you want answered. And then you let your chicken loose and see where it pecks. And because chickens were seen as holy animals, especially by the ancient Greeks, but also in Middle Eastern and African cultures, electromancy is a pretty widespread tradition. Fascinating. And better than reading giblets. Oh, for sure. Or indeed rooting about for cock stones. <laughs> and now what would you like? Door number one or door number three? Three, please. Very well. OK, let's talk about uh, the chicken and its role in Celtic belief. For the chicken was sacred to the ancient goddess Bridget. Well, she's an important one, isn't she? Yeah, definitely. She was another example of the triple goddess who we spoke about on our Maids and Milking episode, having three parts. Bridget the poet, Bridget the healer 
Angela and Bridget the Smith. Her name literally means exalted one, and she was celebrated at Imbolc, aka St. Bridget's Day, on the 1st of February, which is the halfway point between the winter solstice and the spring equinox. And it marks the end of winter and the start of spring, doesn't it? It does, with Bridget being, before she was Christianized, a goddess associated with livestock, including her two sacred oxen, Fea and Femen, and it was traditional in Celtic culture to sacrifice chickens to Bridget on Imbolc and to engage in ritualised cockfighting. That's not very nice. No. I think we can still celebrate Imbolc without ritualised cockfighting and animal sacrifice, don't you? Well, we do it every year, don't we? And I hope Bridget doesn't mind. Last one then, door number one. What's behind hen house door number one? <laughs> door number one hides maybe the most ubiquitous aspect of chickenhood and one already touched on in Henny Penny, crowing as a signal of warning. Well, this one has to be pretty widespread. We know, of course, it crops up in the Bible when Peter betrays Jesus three times and, of course, a cock crows. And Jesus replies, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers up her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Jesus there, preaching for peace and presenting himself as a mother hen. Big thumbs up to that one. And this is not a uniquely Christian bit of folklore, because in Norse mythology, for example, three rooster crows augur the onset of Ragnarok, and in many, many cultures, the crowing of roosters and calls of chickens were thought to serve as warnings or alarms against unwanted visitors, especially supernatural ones. Which makes sense. Aside from dogs, it was very likely that people in the deep past kept chickens yeah. or at least someone in the village would have chickens so if the chickens started going berserk in the middle of the night it was a really handy way of knowing intruders were near supernatural or just foxes yeah quite right plus in folk tales the devil is very often put off whatever naughty thing he's doing if a cock crows indeed in fact in the very first episode of three ravens you told the story of cuthman of stenning when that exact thing happens the cock crows and the devil flees and lots and lots of devil folk tales in that way with the devil up to bad things by night scared off by the cock crowing at the onset of dawn well that's all very very interesting and thank you martin for all of this french hen related <laughs> i don't know what you have planned for the rest of today but do you want to go looking for cock stones? I mean, we could do, I suppose. But before that, Helena, what are you going to be talking about on tomorrow's Advent mini episode? Tomorrow, it's two turtle doves, which should be cute. Oh. Get it? Like it. Cute. Okay, cool. excellent. Well, I'm very much looking forward to that. And we hope everyone has enjoyed your Dying Arts episode also out today, all about traditional Christmas crafts. Yes, we're talking Christmas puddings, kissing bows, and lots of other interesting things. Lovely stuff. Well, we'll be back again tomorrow. And in the meantime, while our French hens have clocked off that way, we'll go this way. And remember, don't whistle till you're out of the woods. God sent every gentleman, such hounds, such hawks, and such lean men, with a down, derry, 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 down.